Gran Turismo 2 is a big game. So big, in fact, that it can't all fit on a single disc. It's got over 600 cars and over 30 tracks, including reverse and variations. It's the first game in the series to feature more cars from other manufacturers around the world. The variety of car manufacturers has increased dramatically to the point where simulation mode has put them into different groups around the city. With the increased car variety, it begs the question, can you beat Gran Turismo 2 without Japanese cars? Oh. Uh, there! Gran Turismo 2 was one of the games I had growing up, solidifying my love for cars and any car going fast. Only recently did I beat the main mode. Not 100%, but winning the World League. There were many ways I could have approached winning the championship, but one thing for certain was that I had to travel to East City to buy a second-hand Japanese car to start with. But there are a bunch of other cars out there from the rest of the world to see and drive! So after beating the championship, I challenged myself to see if it was truly possible to beat Gran Turismo 2 without using a single Japanese car. The rules for this challenge are as follows. Obviously, I can't buy any car from East City, seeing as they're all Japanese. But I am allowed to buy from Acura, since it's located in South City with the other American cars. Hey, if it's legally classified as American in the game, then it's legal to use. You don't like it, you can fight me in the comments. If I get a prize car that's Japanese, I'm forced to sell it. License tests are the main exception to the challenge, since they still need to be done to get anywhere in the game. And for this run, I'll only be doing the special events and the Gran Turismo League events. One rally event is impossible to beat without another Pikes Peak Escudo, and ain't nobody got time for endurance races. And lastly, use of save states is not allowed in races, but is allowed everywhere else. But I mean, it's not like I can use one of the random prize cars in the later events. Oh, uh, by the way, I'll be playing the game on Duck Station on PC with 60 FPS hacks by Cookie PL Monster for your viewing pleasure. Mainly because wobbly, warpy graphics don't scale very well without some perspective correction, and the original game's performance was not great. Sounds easy, right? <laughs> Wrong! Despite the overwhelming amount of cars and car variety in the game, two-thirds of the car roster is Japanese, with there being many duplicates of your Civics or your Skylines. Simulation mode starts you with only 10,000 credits, which isn't much to get you going. The normal way to go is to buy a car from the used car dealers in East City, which is where only Japanese cars are sold. The problem is that out of all the cars we can choose from at the start, there's only one car that's cheap enough to qualify as a quote-unquote starter outside East City. However, this starter is more like torture because it's the Fiat 500R. A tiny little super mini with a two-cylinder engine, only 22 horsepower, and a 0 to 60 time of eventually. And by eventually, I mean almost one minute. At 8,500 credits, it sounds like a deal. And it is. A deal with the devil. It's not fast enough for any race, let alone the Sunday Cup. And even if you fully upgrade it, the 500 would only be fast enough for the first race of Sunday Cup. And even then, the rubber banding is so bad, you'd be lucky to win it. Plus, the amount of credits you'd have to spend to get it to that point would cost more than the car itself, and would take way too long to save up for. As if the early game grind wasn't bad enough. The 500 is a beginner's trap. So that only left me with one other approach. License tests. GT2 hands out prize cars for all gold in each license, but I hadn't really done better than bronze or silver. My initial thought process was that I would pass National A license to get the Dodge Concept car, aka the Copperhead. All the other prize cars are Japanese, so I wouldn't be able to use them. But then I had a bit of a brainwave. Can't I just sell the prize car and get started that way? Fortunately, I had an excuse to get started with this challenge. I got sick. What better way to get around it than to slurp water, sniff, and kill an evening playing GT? Now, the stop-start tests are surprisingly difficult to get gold on, especially the first one with the Toyota Vitz. What a joke. But I eventually get all those done and move on to the circle tests. These gave me trouble when I was testing them out, but I remembered that I have analog steering and can be more precise in turns and I passed. 
Then there were the cornering tests, which are the hardest in the license. All the cars used for the tests are front-wheel drive and are prone to understeer if you don't get the proper line down. The tests with the Integra are the hardest by virtue of cornering, but the tests with a Ford Cougar are the hardest by virtue of speed. This Cougar is a sad front-wheel drive sports car that's about as responsive as a sloth when applying speed to cornering. One of my attempts on B10 was 9 thousandths of a second off the gold time, and most of my attempts consisted of losing all speed in the corners and the brain fog from IT. But after an hour of trying and retrying, I passed B license with all gold and got the Spoon S2000. This wouldn't be a bad starter car if I was allowed to use it for the challenge, so I sold it and prepared to buy my real first car. I had a lot of options, but since I have too much spare time, I compiled a list of cars I could buy with the 22,000 credits I now had. However, I stuck to my guns and bet on Mustang Sally. Getting into the Sunday Cup will remind you of how there isn't a car fast enough to escape the early game rubber banding. I blast off at the start, but these sh boxes kept up for the whole race. Regardless, some upgrades were in order. You know, being a muscle car, it had serious cornering issues compounded by the body roll. I thought the new suspension would help. <laughs> I thought new suspension would help, but it only slightly improved things. The opponent AI on high speed ring in race 2 of Sunday Cup is even tougher, which means I'll probably have to start investing in engine upgrades. I still won, but barely. I put a couple of engine upgrades on my Mustang and realized just how weak the old SN95 Mustangs from the 1990s were. I put a couple of upgrades into the Mustang and it ran into the third race at Red Rock Valley, where opponents were faster than me. But I had the edge in driving strategies, since the AI does not understand the concept of cornering and I can just block my opponents on the long straights. Another close race, but still a win. So with the Sunday Cup done, I decided to complete the other license tests so I could do FR Challenge next. I didn't take these tests as seriously because I just wanted to get them done to compete in other events. And yes, I know, the rally tests are piss easy, but even then, I still found a way to not get gold on them. The international licenses aren't easy, but I still got all of them. And I'm not bothering with super license because it's not necessary. With all our licenses acquired, it was time to tackle the first race of FR Challenge at Clubman Stage Route 5. Thankfully, all events after Sunday Cup and Clubman Cup have weaker rubber banding. Skill issues are still a thing with trying to tame the heft of a muscle car, but I still won and got the Nissan Sil 80. A cool version of the 180SX, but not usable in our playthrough, so it's getting sold. I was finally getting started in GT2, having slaved over the license tests, but I needed to keep grinding it out to either save up for a new car or upgrade the Mustang yet again. But with me being sick and all, my brain was out of gas, so that would have to wait until tomorrow. Congestion only got worse, but I soldiered on. Next, I did the Clubman Cup, since I'd need a more powerful car for the rest of FR Challenge. Rubber banding is still a thing in Clubman Cup, but I still took the first race at Rome short. At least the pay is better than Sunday Cup. Grindelwald was a bit tougher, since the cars were faster, so the Mustang needed some upgrades again. Full Rome circuit was kind of tough to stay in first, since I could always hear those screaming bagpipes behind me. But human cornering and better driving prowess won the day and completed the Clubman Cup. But I still needed some cash and maybe better wheels, so I went and put some more upgrades into the Mustang to give it a fighting chance in the Muscle Car Cup. Sure, older muscle cars had power, but there's one thing they didn't have. Handling. Granted, my car wasn't much better in the handling department compared to all these boats, but good driving won again at Seattle Short, giving us the Plymouth PT Spider. Sadly, it's only going to be useful for like one race of convertible car World Cup since it's so weak, but it's a prize car I can use nonetheless. Mustang Sally got another suspension upgrade to help minimize body roll and carried on to the full Seattle circuit. Cornering beat straight line speed yet again and awarded us with the Shelby Cobra. Unlike the PT Spider, the Cobra is actually useful and overall a very good car. It just needs some suspension upgrades. Plus, it has a resale value of 75,000 credits, which I will absolutely exploit after finishing the cup. We'll put the Cobra through its paces in race 3 at Laguna Seca. Yeah, I biffed to the first turn because I forgot where to break, so let's try again. I 
I did try again, but I determined it also needs better brakes. The new brakes helped a lot on my third attempt, despite the Cobra's tendency to oversteer. But still, third time was the charm, and the prize for winning was the Chrysler Phaeton concept. Maybe I should use that to farm more Cobras instead of using the Cobra to farm Cobras. Real quick, GT2 allows you to win the same prize car multiple times, making for plenty of opportunities to make quick cash. Unfortunately, the Gran Turismo gods were punishing me for being so greedy in tail-happy cars, so I went back to the drawing board. It took me until the second race of FR Challenge to realize that some things were missing on the Cobra. It desperately needed either tire or transmission upgrades. After winning the race and selling the Nismo 270R, I bought a new set of tires and a transmission upgrade. Back to Seattle Circuit to farm another Cobra, I was right about the tires, but wrong about the transmission. Sure, it added a fifth gear, but the ratio was way too close and you can't adjust a sports transmission's gear ratio, meaning I lost over 20 miles per hour from my car's top speed. The tires kept me from spinning out, thankfully, and I was able to acquire another Cobra to sell for 75k, alongside the 8k for winning the race. With all the money I had now accumulated, I splurged on a racing transmission as well as engine upgrades to make the thing fly. It was time to finish FR Challenge at Midfield Raceway. The Cobra still wanted to oversteer, but I kept things under control and blew past the Corvettes and British luxury cars. The prize was a Mazda RX-7 GTC, which looked nice, but was of no use to us. After spending some time to rest during the day, I went back into the game and spent some of my hard-earned cash on a four-wheel drive car. The Lancia Delta HF Integrale Evolution. Now I eventually want to give this the racing modification which turns it into the rally car clad in its not-martini livery. But for now, it was off to Seattle's short course yet again. Despite being about 40 or so horsepower below the limit, the Delta maintained its lead for all of the race, which earned us another car I couldn't use. The Subaru Legacy Touring Wagon. Not that I'd use it anyway. The extra cash was used for more upgrades to take on the full fat Seattle circuit again. Buying some medium slicks gave the Delta some fantastic grip, and its power upgrade kept all opponents as a speck in the rearview mirror. The prize was the preceding model of the Nismo 400R, which is a cool R33 if it weren't for the typo and the fact that, well, you get the idea. I couldn't really do much with a martini machine for the third race, seeing that the power limit was now almost 700 horsepower. I decided to run the PT Spider through the one race it can pretty much enter in, the first race of Convertible Car World Cup. It was too weak for any MR Challenge race, especially considering that it'd get creamed by the road GT40. The Spider beats everyone else on Tahiti Road and then retires to obscurity. Not even you could save Plymouth. The A-Spec Miata is our prize and is another 7,000 credits in our bank. I decided to take a moment and mull over which mid-engine car I would use for the mid-engine challenge. My first inclination was the GT40 road car, but that costs over half a million credits. And I know the PT Spider won't win any of the races, so I'll either buy the Venturi Atlantique 400 GT or the Acura NSX. Hey, I said Acura counts for this challenge. Thing is, the cheapest NSX is over 90k, so I decided to go for the FF challenge instead. The Ford Taurus SHO was my front runner, but I already used that in my main save file and wanted to try something different. I decided on the 1995 Integra Type R since it had the most potential in my book. Back to Tahiti we go. I like how my tuned Integra sounds. It sounds almost like an electric guitar. The Integra rocks its way through Tahiti Road and wins us the Mugen Accord SIRT, which is another seven grand for our pocketbook. After a couple of upgrades, it was off to Midfield Raceway, where it dueled a Nissan Pulsar on the final straight due to a cornering goof I did at the hairpin. Regardless, the Rocker won and got us the Tom's T111, which has less value than the Accord I sold from the last race. What a ripoff! I said screw it and bought a Stage 2 Turbo for the Rocker and moved on to Trial Mountain. I gotta say, the early game AI really bugs me with both how it behaves and how it cheats. The Rocker dueled with an FTO and a Celica on the two laps, but choosing the course secured the dub since the AI don't ever cut on the final corner. With FF Challenge complete, the final reward was the Mugen Prelude Type S. More money in our pocket. 
Speaking of money, I needed to do some research on what the most effective mid-engine purchase would be. But that would be something I'd have to sleep on and make up my mind about tomorrow. I'm now in the decongestion phase of being sick, which means I'm getting better but still not fit to go out and do anything. Except play more Gran Turismo. I made up my mind and decided to try one of the Lotus Elise cars, but I needed some more money, so I went back to the Cobra Farms. But in the middle of the race, I had another brainwave. What if I took the Cobra and ran it in Gran Turismo All-Stars? With the money from farming another Cobra, I slapped more upgrades onto it and jumped to race 3 at Red Rock Valley. Nope, it did not work in the slightest. These cars were too strong and handled way better. Well, back to Puget Sound again. While coasting through first place, I had a few thoughts race through my head. One, Seattle looks like it'd be a nice place to live in if it weren't for the crime, but you can just remove Seattle and put in any big city and you'd still be right. Two, this would have been a nice course to see in GT7, but it'd be problematic since the street layout used up until GT on PSP no longer exists. The old kingdom is gone, and the set of 90 degree corners near the end run through a parking lot at whatever the hell the Seattle Seahawks football stadium is called. 3. How good does the Motorsport Elise handle? Uh, yes, but I don't think it was worth buying over the NSX. That had more horsepower from the start and was about 10k cheaper. Whatever, I still won the race. This won us the Toyota TRD 2000 GT, a souped-up MR2 that would serve us no use. I was once again in a stagnant state trying to figure out what to do next, since I'd have to replay races over and over to save up for another car. This meant two more trips back to Seattle for Cobras, which I won't bother showing you as it's too repetitive. After making this pit stop, my clouded brain decided to try using another controller just for the hell of it. Up to this point, I'd been using an Xbox controller, the one that matches my hat, so I tried the DualSense to see how that worked. I mean, come on, it is a PlayStation game after all. After selling two identical Cobras, I bought the Venturi Atlantique 400 GT, not the Biturbo, that's a waste of money, and dumped most of my money into it knowing that I can get it all back after the third race. But I had to contend with the second race first. The upgrades, thankfully, were overkill for the race at High Speed Ring, and the French Ferrari dusted the pack. The prize was the Tom's T020, which was yet another modified MR2 that I couldn't use. Unlike that Tom's car from earlier, it sold from the same price as the 2000 GT MR2 that we won from the first race. Now, I didn't have enough money to completely max out the Atlantic, so I instead put it on a nice set of Super Advans and prayed to the GT gods to give me strength to beat the Ford GT40 and my prayers were answered. While the GT road car is fast, it still made less horsepower than what my tuned Atlantique put out. The cherry on top of winning mid-engine challenge was the GT40 race car in its iconic Gulf blue and orange livery. While I could redo the race and win another GT40 to sell for 250,000 credits, I had a better idea. This time I'd try Gran Turismo All-Stars Race 3 again since I now had a more capable, purpose-built racing machine. Even if the GT40 was from 1969, nice. it was still competitive for GT2 since it has tons of grip, a lot of horsepower, and all the fittings of tuning needed to go fast. But only barely. Back at Red Rock, I had to run a five lap race against race cars and skill issues. The top three cars were all faster than me, but by lap three I could smell blood in the water as I closed the gap on the Toyota GT1. And on the final lap, I overtook it. It had a faster straight-line speed than the mighty GT40, but cheap tactics and proper cornering won the day yet again. An intense duel to the end. As the trophy of our hard-fought victory, we were graced with a TVR Speed 12, which is one of the fastest cars in the game. Now it was time to go back to Red Rock with Fury, and some tuning so I don't toss it into a ditch on the first lap. I bet you can see where I'm going with this. The Speed 12 has a bonkers resale value of half a million credits, so I'm going back to Red Rock to win it again and completely break progression. I quickly followed a tuning guide to this monster in hopes of taming its excessive rear wheel power. It's all fine when you're out of second gear, but the first two gears make so much wheel spin. Plus, catching the corners the wrong way can cause you to lose control. But I held on and got another Speed 12, which I sold for way too much money. Now that I had more money than I'd ever need, I had a couple of options. 
I could buy a fast all-wheel drive car and finish four-wheel drive challenge, or I could turn the martini machine into what it was meant to be. I decided on the latter and sent it to Laguna Seca to finish what it had started. Holy crap! The martini machine has grip for days! Most all-wheel drive cars tend to understeer, but not this Delta, apparently. It gripped the twists and turns of Laguna Seca like a magnet, leaving the skylines and lancers to get lost in the corkscrew. Although the martini machine was over 200 horsepower below the limit, it knew how to use all 400 of them without any worries of summoning Takanobu Mitsuyoshi for if I lost. And for all that, I got the Mines GTR R32.5. Why the hell is it called the R32.5? I'll never know, because it's just another 17k in my wallet. A quick check at the game's status shows that we're about 10% of the way complete, but for the sake of the challenge, we're about a quarter or a fifth of the way through. It all comes down to what cars I want to play around with next, since not only do I want to try cars I've never used, but I also want to beat the special events as the GT gods intended. Satisfied with the spoils of my victory and for officially breaking sequence, I cracked open another water and retired for the night, ready to wash away my congestion and any other race that stood in my way. I myself am still not 100% at this point since I was still congested and my fever kept cropping back up, but I was still on the mend. I just wish the same could have been said for the rest of my household. Anyway, I started off by going the cheapest route possible with the venerable Mini Cooper. It would take on the K-Car challenge, but out of order so I can upgrade it. Now everything was going well until I remembered what a pain turn one is in Seattle, and went back to do some transmission work. And this time I did the unthinkable and decided to start exercising my left foot. But that stupid Daihatsu move refused to move, so another set of upgrades were in order. Stickier tires definitely helped, and were nearly lost by my skill issues at the last corner. Regardless, the Red Rover would not roll over and would emerge with a win. The prize was an A-spec Mazda Demio, which was totally useless to us. The Red Rover would move on to Tahiti Road next, with the money going into turbo upgrades for the first race. At the start, is that a Mazda Speed AZ-1? Also, Red Rover is really slow, but that's not necessarily a bad thing. Because the Mini is slow, it doesn't need to brake as often and can use its momentum to speed through corners. It's as much of a momentum car as the Miata, or the Mugen CRX2, but whatever. Red Rover, now with a snail riding on its back, took its 120 horsepower and spent a lovely day in Rome. The turbo made it feel so much faster. After finishing up the Italian job, Red Rover retired to the garage and was briefly accompanied by the Red Mugen Beat before it was unceremoniously sold. My next move would be the Compact Car World Cup, since it was the next cheapest series to get into, but I had to make another trek to the dealerships since all my compact cars were over the horsepower limit. I may be stretching things with what my definition of a compact means, but I'll make up for it because I DRIVE A DODGE STRATUS! With no racing modification available, I decided to troll everyone watching this video and give it the raised Vesta strawberry wheels, and sending this American nightmare back to Rome. This is probably the only time I willingly use a Dodge Stratus, especially with these wheels, since the real-life Stratuses from this time are all rusty piles of junk. The least I can say about the Stratus is that it looks like a car. Well, that's not the least I can say about it, because I can also say I DRIVE A DODGE STRATUS! Oh, and a joke wandered into the garage after the race. At least it wasn't pink. Back to Seattle Short again, I never liked Turn 1 of Seattle since it reduces all the best racing lines to spaghetti, but I kept the Strawberry Stratus under control even though it was much more antsy this time around. And now I'm hungry. We got the Renault Clio 16 valve, which I would rather take the money than keep in my garage. Sorry Clio and your 106 horsepower. The money from the poor old Clio went into buffing the Strawberry Stratus to give it more horsepower. Not quite American horsepower, since it has a turbo in it, but more power nonetheless. This is one of those races that makes me wish I could go all burnout on the opponents. But I knew that wasn't guaranteed to work, since the AI are like slot cars and won't budge. Thankfully, also like slot cars, they go off the track because they're going too fast. So I used that knowledge to my advantage and finished the arc of the Strawberry Stratus. And for that, we got a car that was even worse than the Clio. The Volkswagen Lupo. Sold off without remorse. I was satisfied with this day of action and retired for the night, no longer bound by moderate congestion and ready to take on another slate of races. Maybe by thawing out the Chrysler Phaeton? 
Now, I've still got some congestion lingering by this point, but I'm feeling way better compared to the start of the challenge. Thing is, the Phaeton has too much horsepower for the events I wanted to enter with it. Except the last one, but that's at high speed ring of all places. The Phaeton isn't cutting it, even if it had a V12 making 509 horsepower. But it actually has a V12 that makes 425 horsepower. But our boat couldn't win even at ramming speed. Now I needed a quick influx of cash to fund my next purchase, so I took the lazy route and took the GT40 back to MR Challenge 3. But it allowed me to tell the other GT40 in the race, I am you, but better. Real quick, can't we just stop and lament the fact that Red Rock Valley never came back in any Gran Turismo game after this one? It's such a good looking track on the PS1 with its sunset backdrop. Funnily enough, I associate the song I Think I'm Paranoid by Garbage with this racetrack. Obviously, since it was a song in the game. A little extra financial breathing room never hurt. Now, the Audi S4 counts as a luxury sedan, right? I'm gonna say it does, even though it's not as big as one. And because I got it in yellow, it's also getting blessed with Super Advan wheels. New rule! If I buy a yellow car, I have to put Super Advans on them. When in Rome, you must learn whether or not your car is correctly tuned. And with the S4, the answer is yes. All-wheel drive was a nice bonus to have, and if a Dodge Intrepid can be classified as a luxury car, then I can use my S4. Also, remember when Audi cars looked distinctive, and not when they all looked like the R8? The prize in the first race was the Honda Accord Type R. We never got it from Japan, and it's going to stay that way. I splurged on tuning the S4 into an almost proper race car just shy of buying a racing modification. Special Stage Route 5 came and went, and so did all those poor saps and their intrepids and their skylines. This gave us the Toyota Chaser TRD X30. Quite the handsome JDM sedan, if I do say so. Hate to see it leave, but love to watch it go. For the race I originally tried with the Phaeton, I went balls deep into maxing out the turbo on the S4, making it a 580 plus horsepower belcher. I don't know if I mentioned this already, but tuning a car close to or at the power limit for a race is usually overdoing it. But as the saying goes, if it's worth doing, it's worth overdoing. The prize is a four-door R33 GTR tuned by Autech and Nismo in bright yellow. If I was allowed to keep it, I'd definitely give it the Super Advan treatment. Speaking of which... We were off to tuned NA car number one cup in the yellow Speed 12, ready to put these JDM tuning machines in their place. As soon as I saw the Spoon Civic in front, I knew this was going to be a piece of cake. But then I remembered I was driving the Speed 12, which is too powerful for any human to handle. It still leagues faster than any of the other cars on the grid, and was able to win with ease on all two laps. Oh, wait. Oh, it's three laps! Three laps. Yeah. Now the thing is, there are four different prize cars, but only three races. If that doesn't make any sense, I haven't finished my sentence, Red Team. The prize you win is chosen at random. But seeing as all four prize cars are Japanese, I'd have to sell them no matter what. On top of the 50,000 credits, the game blessed me with the B-Spec Miata. Weak sauce. Oh boy, I'm not looking forward to Grindelwald in this thing. What if I mix up my tire compounds to prioritize grip? I decided to put soft slicks in the front, but keep medium slicks in the rear, since this isn't a long race where tire wear is a thing. Or at least, it's not telegraphed to the player, because I feel that tires do have some degree of wear in all races. The softs did help with grip to some extent, because a sane individual wouldn't dare run all softs in this beast. Grindelwald went by in a flash and wasn't all that bad. But the Spoon Integra Type R was, at least in comparison to the Speed 12. Now for Laguna Seca. I know the prize isn't going to be good, so I'll just run it for the money it gives out. But wait a minute, why are there two Peugeot rally cars here? Whatever, they're still too weak compared to the TBR. The random prize this time is the C-Spec Miata. I love how this Miata looks. Sad to see it go. With that, the next day came to a close and left me thinking what I could use in the turbo equivalent, seeing as I'd likely get dusted by the drag racing cars and their combined 2,000 horsepower. I'd give myself time to think about it while I go and clear the other events first. Well, it looks like it's time to throw a dart at the wall and see what I land on. We're doing station wagons! As it turns out, there aren't any station wagons made by the rest of the world available in the dealerships. 
but this is still GT2 we're talking about, so only the power limit matters in this case. I was really hoping to do everything that was intended by Polyphony, but I suppose we'll have to buy a car that looks like a station wagon. I settled on the BMW 323Ti Compact and stuffed it to the gills with upgrades. We took the quote-unquote station wagon for a run around Rome short, confirming my fears that there are only Japanese station wagons that you can drive. I swear there was a BMW station wagon since they made one in real life. The quote-unquote station wagon won, and we were blessed with the Subaru WRX STI wagon. More money in the bank, and too much spent on maxing it out. Now it was off to the super speedway for some old-fashioned oval track racing. Finished in less than two minutes without much hassle. I mean, it is just a simple oval track. Gee, I wonder what the next prize car will be. Did you guess tuned Japanese wagon? If so, you're right! Last race is at Special Stage Route 5. No drama here, just a station wagon racing among other station wagons. I probably could have picked a better car for this series and saved money, but I still won it all. And we got the Nissan Stagia 260RS Nismo, which we, of course, can't use. Now, Convertible Car World Cup was really bothering me since I hadn't finished it yet, so I went out and bought another TVR for the garage, the Chimera 5.0. And of course I got it in yellow, gotta keep the quota going. The Chimera tore through Grindelwald, rocking its Super Advance loud and proud. And also sounding like it was taking a hit from a ball. In the interest of trying to keep this video monetized, we're gonna give it a new muffler and intake. Right after we sell this MRS concept. I cut off the Chimera from the dank stuff and let it sit in rehab while the Cobra was pressed back into service. But the Cobra protested me every chance it could at Trial Mountain. It just refused to grip for me and spun out by the rocks. But with all its horsepower, it caught up on the forest canopy straight and overtook the other Chimera in front with a top rope move in the last corner. The second rope, top rope. <laughs> now in the lead, I played it safe with my braking to keep the damn thing on the track and winning in the most Trial Mountain way possible. Convertible Car World Cup was finished and netted us the Dodge Friggin' Concept Car LM Edition. I think this copper had a staying with us, my friends. I spent time mulling over what to do next, and I was heavily leaning towards the Historic Car Cup. But I don't know what I'd use that would qualify as Historic. But to help me make up my mind on the cars I would use, I needed more money, so I won another Speed 12 off camera. Now that my budget was a bit bigger, I could think long and hard about what to use in the Historic Car Cup tomorrow. Oh, and my congestion is almost gone at this point. Just so you know. At this point, I felt like I was doing too little, spending no more than an hour each day on the races. However, doing one hour's worth of races is the most I can deal with in one sitting, so I started one of two sessions today. So this time around, I would buy another Delta Integrale, but of course, keeping with quota. The Delta HF Integrale is what I'd consider historic today, but not necessarily in the context of 1999 when this game came out. Starting with Tahiti, oh look, it's a Fiat 500R! See you later, squirt. The Delta is still one of the best handling cars in the game, mainly because it's not going way too fast. The yellow Delta was able to fend off the likes of the Stratos and the 240Z and win, getting us the Mugen CRX3? What kind of historical car is that? For race two at Rome Circuit, the yellow Delta needed some upgrades, but it also needed luck to be on our side because it was time to play he's there slash he's not there. Oh, the GT40 is in front. Nope. I'm just wasting days to not get the GT40 in the starting grid because I'm not allowed to use save states to get the lineup I need. Thankfully, third time was the charm once again because that cheater who was 10 horsepower over the limit was nowhere to be seen. This allowed the grippy yellow Delta to outmaneuver its competition without much of a threat. Our prize was the Lotus Europa in British Racing Green. That would have been nice for MR Challenge a few days ago. Speaking of MR, you know what that means. My plan was to buy the GT40 road car at some point, and now was the time. It only has 305 horsepower against the third race's 395 horsepower limit, but by golly does it know how to use it even against an identical yellow GT40. The Shelby Daytona would have been the biggest threat had it not been for better cornering knowledge. Or maybe those super ad vans. The prize was the Toyota XYR Celica concept car. Useless. 
this time around, the dartboard said we'd finished GT All-Stars, and I had the perfect track weapon for it. Several left turns at Super Speedway later, and the first race was done with my best speed record being about 210 miles per hour. Our prize was the Mines Lancer Evo 5. Neat, but not needed. Race 2 is at Special Stage Route 5. Well, unfortunately, the Speed 12 just Speed 12 itself, because making contact with a wall will definitely spin you out. Yeah, the Speed 12 isn't working out here on Route 5, so I'm going back to Red Rock to be greedy and save up more money. But I'm sure you don't want to see the same footage over and over again, so I won't record it. I decided to put my money into the Vector Wiegert W8 Twin Turbo. Jesus. Upgrade the crap out of it, and then look up a tuning guide for the car to avoid the same mistakes as the Speed 12. And you know what? Also tune in Speed 12. A guide by T Kanji was really useful in trying to tame these beastly machines. I'll leave a link in the description if anyone else wants to use it in their GT2 playthroughs. It was the W8's turn to test the waters of Route 5, and uh, nope, it spun out and could not corner. Maybe that's just me. It was the Speed 12's turn again, now with its new tuning setup. The new tune really allowed me to exercise throttle control in the race, since I had throttle mapped to the right analog stick. It's not all or nothing like with just a regular face button, so this allowed me to tame this beast for real this time, and run away with the lead without spinning out once. This got us a healthy 50k and the mines R34 GTR, which meant an additional 20,000. On to Rome circuit again. A stupid Viper would not move for one lap, but I overtook it on the second lap and flew away. Throttle control was the key yet again, as well as knowing to brake sooner since I was going so much faster, like on the second half with the long straight. By lap 3 I had to start braking at the lead up into the 90 degree turn since I was close to 200 miles per hour and couldn't brake fast enough to turn safely on lap 1. <sighs> The prize was the mighty Tommy Kyra ZZ2, a 588 horsepower mid-engine supercar with a premium resale price. Awesome. If there was a true test of any tuned car, it would be the corkscrew at Laguna Seca. It was ridiculously easy because at this point all the things I'd learned about sim racing were all starting to mesh together. Watch those distance signs, use the tire marks as a hint for your corner, ease onto the throttle when exiting a turn, etc, etc. With that, GT All-Stars is done, and this grants us the Nissan R390 GT1 road car. One badass homologation special, and another quarter million in the bank. What I really, really wanted to see beaten was tuned turbo car number one cup. Specifically the test course, where facing one of the two HKS drag cars was likely. With the W8, I did see one of the HKS drag cars, and it was fast, but I knew I could win this because it breaks at the turn. That's where I realized, it bleeds. I can kill it. All those losers braked at the turns, but I didn't need to. As such, the mighty HKS drag car was slain by an American cheese wedge. Now that wasn't so bad. Another big payday nets us another random prize car in which I knew two of them were the HKS drag cars. Instead, I got the mine's R33 GTR with 618 horsepower. Pretty sweet, but uh, you know the drill by now. Heading back to Special Stage Route 5, I needed to take my throttle control mindset and apply it to the W8 so as not to spin out. It worked! While cruising in the lead, I lamented the fact that the game had become ridiculously easy at this point since progression was broken long ago. But that also had me thinking that it was like motorsport in real life. The best way to win is to bend the rules. And by that I mean taking the rules you're given and loopholing your way through them to give yourself an advantage. If I can enter an American supercar against a bunch of heavily modified Japanese sports cars simply because it has turbochargers, then it's not cheating. We add another 50k to our pocketbook and pick up a Nismo 400R in red. Good looking car, but just another sum of cash. The last race is in Deep Forest, which unexpectedly tosses us airborne on turn 2. I was never a big fan of the interior of Deep Forest, simply because of all the chicanes and the blind corners, but once you break away into the rock wall, it's all good from there. The W8 once again puts the Japanese tuner cars in their place, and proves it's the number one turbo tuner car. More money, and the random prize is the mine's R33 GTR again. Damn it, I could've used another quarter million from the HKS drag cars. Next, I wanted to do 80s Sports Car Cup, and I didn't have many options to choose from, so I chose the Lotus Europa, even though it was not from the 1980s. I didn't know the Europa had a racing modification. Anyway, I got the Europa up to spec for the first race at Trial Mountain and took the boat sailing. 
I wasn't sure how a car this long could be this light, but one, it's not that long, and two, this is Lotus we're talking about. The Europa makes an El Camino look like a whale and handles better than one, too. With the first race of the 80s Cup done, we were treated to the Mugen Civic Ferio. I like the blue lugs on the wheels, but it's still a Honda Civic at the end of the day. My plan for the second and third races was to buy a Corvette. And I have to say that I love how the C3 Corvette looks, even though it was choked by emissions regulations when this C3 came out. A white RX-7 chased the Corvette throughout the streets of Special Stage Route 5, but all I could see was the signature taillights. There's still a deal of body roll even with the suspension upgrade, but on the straights it did what an American V8 car should. Pull away from everyone else. The prize for winning the race was... something eerily familiar. With the same CRX Del Sol gone, it was back to deep forest. The Corvette cruised past all the Toyotas in this race without much hassle, giving us the Mugen Civic Type R. Cool. I didn't need to put much else onto the Corvette to keep it competitive with the last two races. In Seattle, I jammed the car on the guardrails on the hills on the lap two and lost control, but was able to retake the lead on the long straight where American cars thrive. For our efforts, we got the Mugen Integra Type R. Next! We find ourselves here again on Tahiti Road. The Corvette can't take some of these turns at higher speeds like the chicane at turn 3 because it's simply too long in the tooth. Not as bad as the late 80s Supras, though. With that, the 80s Sports Car Cup draws to a close and rewards us with the legendary Nissan Skyline Silhouette Formula R30. The blue one. And yes, back in one of my other videos about racing games, I thought that one of the cars in Racing Lagoon was an R31 instead of this R30 it's actually based on but it made us 125,000 credits richer. There are more events to finish, but I called it a day and went to watch the Super Bowl. Ah, good times. It's a brand new week, and I'm even closer to finishing all the special events. So now was the time to finish the third lineup of special events, starting with Pure Sports Car Cup. Here, I'm just going to reuse what I've already got since most of these cars could be considered sports cars. The Corvette goes first at Laguna Seca. Now, if we wanted to get into the debate of what could be considered a pure sports car, it inadvertently would go deep into political stuff, and I prefer to keep my politics out of my racing games. Whatever the case, the Corvette wins and picks up the Tom's Angel T01, which isn't based on any car and is an original creation from Tom's. Not that we can use it. We brought the TVR Chimera out of rehab for the second race at Deep Forest, where I unfortunately had to diagnose it with Smoker's Lung thanks to the new muffler. All this time spent not driving it and it can't kick its habits. It's still one at the end of the day, but now it's only a matter of time before it pulls a TVR and catches fire. Because where there's smoke, there's fire. New to the garage is the not-so-legendary Tommy Kyra ZZ3, or what would later become the Autobox Garaya. Next! Final race at Trial Mountain, and this is Ford GT40 territory. It had a blast slipping, sliding, and jumping all over the track, as well as pulling so far away from its competition that it wasn't even funny. In the events that the GT40 race car can enter into, it's practically overkill. After wiping the floor with the competition, we're rewarded with the TVR Tuscan Speed 6. Good, because I think I heard a faint explosion in my garage. Good thing I can use this for Grand Touring Car Trophy. I just need to upgrade it a bit. It turns out it has a racing modification, but it's butt ugly, so I won't be buying it. We return to Red Rock once again, and the Speed 6 grumbles its way past a couple Skylines, a 3000 GT, and two Chevys. But it needs stickier tires if it wants to keep going, as well as maybe some more engine upgrades. And the prize car will give us just that, as the Daishin Silvia gives us 125k for selling it. After applying upgrades, we head off to lovely Grand Valley. The Speed 6 uses the other cars as collateral damage on turn 1, saving myself from eating dirt. It then breaks free from the pack with no drama, securing another win. That also nets us another JGTC car. The 1998 Castrol Mugen NSX. Sweet! Another quarter million! For the last race, I pulled out the French Ferrari and rebalanced the engine, officially maxing out the car's power. The Atlantique once again charged through the entire grid and left them all behind, looking and feeling good in the process. No, seriously, I love how the Atlantique looks. After a 30,000 credit bath, we also got another 250,000 in the Unicia Jex R33 Skyline with its 702 horsepower. 
Now with all this cash to splash, I might just be able to buy a purpose-built race car other than the GT40. I decided to shop around for a bit to determine what to drive for Super Touring Trophy. I already knew what I'm using for GT300 and GT500, so I needed some time to think. I decided to pull the trigger on the Roof Turbo R, in yellow, naturally, and see if I could upgrade it to keep it competitive with DTM cars that I'd probably face. But then I realized I wasted my money since the weight savings increased the horsepower. Ugh. Well, I guess I'll use the GT40 for this, then use the Turbo R later. Race 1 is at Apricot Hill, and god do I hate driving on this track. They're all just a bunch of corners that fool you into thinking they're easy corners, especially Turn 2. Not only that, but I also hate apricots. The GT40 beats out a bunch of race-modified sedans to win 15k and the Toyota TRD 3000 GT, a heavily tuned Supra from the first game. Next! On to Trial Mountain and I think you get the idea, jumping and sliding around the twists, bumps, and other things. And because I was so far ahead, I had a little fun with the e-brake at the end of the race. And across the line! This nabs us the Tom's Supra. Not the Castrol Supra, that's for a different race. And now it's back to Laguna Seca. Honestly, the GT40 winning so effectively was getting boring, so I tried spicing things up a bit by changing camera view each lap. And I'll also do the same thing with a replay by going with a top-down view a la Micro Machines. This race added the 30th anniversary Camaro Z28 to our garage. I'm not inclined to keep this, but I'm doing it anyway, because I'm allowed to. Back once again to Deep Forest, and back to the old change camera each lap strat. But this time I screwed with the e-brake because I was getting really bored. I actually spun out playing with the e-brake, but never lost the lead since the others were so far behind. To prove that they were so far behind, I switched to the rear view in the replay and could not see a single sedan behind me. Oh, and I forgot the prizes were random in this cup, too, because the 3000 GT Supra moseyed it on back into the garage. Out, I say! Out! Finally, we went to Rome Circuit, where I chose to drive in the bumper camera for the entire race, and the sedans still didn't put up any fight. More top-down replay nonsense. With that, the final two championships are all that's left, and oh, will you get out of here?! Sheesh. After a break, it was time to run the GT300 championship with the GT40 race car. The championship nets 15,000 credits for first in each race, plus an additional 100,000 for winning the championship, not to mention a random prize car. Not only did I forget that it was a rolling start, but I forgot to change the refresh rate of my CRT back to 60Hz to not get those stutters from an FPS mismatch in the capture. Race 1 at Grand Valley East starts with a brief duel with the RE RX-7 before dusting it, as well as the other GT300 JGTC cars. Race 2 is Laguna Seca. Same story, the RE RX-7 duels me early on the first lap, only to be unceremoniously passed and never seen again for the rest of the race. They did stay fairly close, but not close enough to pose a real challenge. Race 3 is at Deep Forest. I had a couple of skill issues on the second and third laps, but I kept my composure and maintained my lead, eventually riding off into the sunset. Race 4 is Midfield Raceway, one of my favorites. I just love the straights as well as the twists and turns. I also love how the AI always goes in the dirt on the final hairpin. Again, it's like watching slot cars flying off the track. And then there's Apricot Hill. Never liked this track, and never will. But at least now it's over, and I won the championship by 10 points. This gets us a new car, which I believe is random. It rewards us with the Zanavi Arda Silvia from 1999, which we convert to 125,000. Now we're gonna take all the money we made, spend it on that roof I bought earlier, and have ourselves a ball in the GT500 Championship. No power limit means no restriction on fun. Race 1 is once again at Laguna Seca, and it proves to be too much for the Turbo R. So that means we once again enlist the aid of the Speed 12. Speed 12's power is absolutely corrupting to the weak-minded, meaning that if you don't control the accelerator, you'll more than likely spin out and crash but it feels so good to be reaching toward 200 miles per hour on long straights, only to be brought back to reality when you approach a corner. Oh, and the 500 gives out more money per race. I'm gonna be rich! I mean, I already am, but I'm gonna be even richer. Next is Super Speedway. Do I even need to say anything? 
third up is Rome Circuit. My last lap ended up being my fastest, and I felt like everything had all meshed together with track memorization and how the Speed 12 behaves. It's like the car is speaking to me, telling me when to go easy and when to go flat out. Maybe I should see an exorcist. Number 4, Trial Mountain. The uneven terrain of the track makes the car want to lose control, spinning out on lap 3. But because of the car's raw power, it easily retakes the lead on the canopy straight. I had to remember not to fight the car, just let it ease out of its traction loss and ease in to regaining control. Last and definitely least, it's Apricot Hill. I still hate driving on it even if I get ahead of the pack. The Speed 12 isn't the best at cornering given its power and its length, but I kept it from going off the track and won the race. With that, the GT500 Championship and all special events are complete, rewarding us with a Takata NSX, or another 250k. We were now ready to take on the GT League events next, but I needed to check what cars I'd need to win with. I felt spooked by the Speed 12 and wanted to try something new for the World League. But I had a very large espace in my head, tempting me with an oddball. It's finally time to tackle the Gran Turismo League. Once again, power restrictions are the only restrictions in place, so it was time for the Lotus Europa to shine yet again. All races of one Nationals event take place in the same track with larger horsepower limits. The first race of Japan Nationals at Midfield Raceway was for their Europa, which takes care of it with ease. There are no prize cars in the Nationals, just fairly small amounts of credits. Race number two called for the services of the Strawberry Stratus, but a screw-up at the hairpin on the final lap costs us the race and we have to start over. The Strawberry Stratus keeps steady on the second attempt, and we win the second race. I mean, of course I won it, because I drive a Dodge Stratus! Last race at midfield, and we pull out the GT40 road car. Of course it wasn't even close. Japan Nationals are now done, now it's on to US Nationals. First race of Laguna Seca, and hey, it's one of the other events that the PT Spider can actually enter. It's kind of silly to think its main competition is a Ford Ka, but the Ka decided to be mean at the end of the first lap and give us a little nudge. Hey, it's not my fault you can't corner. For the second race, I choose not to bring out Mustang Sally and instead go for the grip of the yellow Delta. Seriously, I cannot reiterate how much grip the Delta has. It's so good at cornering. And really, the only car I can enter comfortably in race 3 is the Corvette. The AI really loves to spill into the dirt, especially on turn 1, the corkscrew, and the final corner. I wanted to put attention on the red Camaro in this race because it got chewed up by the corkscrew more than others, mainly because the rest of the pack got tangled up. Now that's some trademark GT2 AI if I have ever seen it. Next up is the French Nationals, and the PT returns yet again for Tahiti Road. Been there, done that. Although, one nice touch is that some of the sponsorship signs are set to the logos of the three French car makers in the game, Peugeot, Citroën, and Venturi. A cool attention to detail that was totally unnecessary. Now, the French Ferrari is unfortunately too strong to enter in the French Nationals, so the yellow Delta was called upon to take its place. Okay, I take back what I said about the sponsorship signs. They're still random since now there's Alfa Romeo and Fiat signs in a French race. French Nationals only had two races, so yeah, that was done quickly. On to UK Nationals at Trial Mountain, and the Europa is right at home. The boat is able to fend off the swarm of MGs and Minis, but only barely. This is the homecoming it gets. Race 2, we summon the spirits of Ken Miles and Bruce McLaren to guide the GT40 road car to victory. They told me to sod off, so I went and won the race with its 305 horsepower anyway. No Lotus or Jaguar could catch the GT40, or even anything around 345 horsepower. Race 3, and we're using the Corvette again. Let me tell you, there's nothing more terrifying than seeing a trio of TVRs in your rear view, slowly closing in on the canopy straight. Back, you foul beasts! UK Nationals was complete, so it was on to Italy. The Lotus Europa took on Rome Short. There, it handled the Fiats and Alphas with ease. I mean, they were all practically economy cars, the kind of cars you could buy at the start of the game, if you had enough credits. Onto the full Rome circuit, and we once again task the yellow Delta with the race. I'm doing this to save money on cars that I don't need, so apologies if I'm using the same four to five cars. You gotta be resourceful. Now, I was initially concerned that the other Delta in the grid would be a threat, but nope. All the other cars are fairly below the power limit, which meant I could coast into a comfortable lead. The Italian Nationals were now done. Last up on the Nationals was German Nationals. 
I forgot they were all at Deep Forest instead of Grindelwald. And I don't think I actually have a car that's near the 216 horsepower limit, so we're gonna fix that. The BMW 320Ci joins the garage and will ultimately be useful for this one race. This Opel Astra did not want any part of it on turn one and kinda crept behind throughout the rest of the race. But it didn't catch up and was passed by an Audi A3 on the last lap. Race two and the yellow Delta goes around for what might be the last time. The Delta rides off into the sunset at Deep Forest, knowing that its purpose has been fulfilled. But we weren't done yet. For the job of cleaning up the German Nationals as well as the Nationals in general, it went to the TVR Tuscan Speed 6. The Speed 6 lumbered its way through the woods and never looked back. The Nationals were over. Now it was time to move up to the big leagues. For EuroLeague, I was indecisive. Did I want to spend a lot of money on a new race car, or should I try to give the GT40 another chance? I ended up choosing to let the GT40 run in the EuroLeague, starting at... Ugh. Apricot? Well, as it turns out, my worries were for naught, as the GT40 and its Gulf livery breezed past the other cars. The GT40 is one of the best race cars in the game, with it only likely to lose to the Speed 12, the Pikes Peak Escudo, the Toyota GT1, or the HKS drag cars. Other than cars like that, nothing else can touch it. The EuroLeague does dish out prize cars, and our prize was the iconic, legendary Castrol Supra. I can't even keep it just to gawk at it? Please? Okay... Moving on to Grand Valley, and the other cars are nothing but specks in the mirror. What else did you think was going to happen? Our prize for winning is the Zexel Skyline R33. NEXT! Last race of the league is at Rome Circuit yet again. And I think you get the picture by now, the GT40 is in a league of its own. They never stood a chance. The prize for winning is another JGTC car. The Cure... Cure? Cure? Whatever. R33. I'm glad they're all JGTC cars, because that means more money for us. For the Pacific League, the power limit went down to 542 horsepower. But to us, that doesn't mean a damn thing. The GT40 is still eligible. On to midfield! Not a chance for the other American and Japanese cars. The prize is the Nissan 300ZX GTS, a badass race car with another quarter million in our pocket. Seattle Circuit is a cakewalk. Turn 1 proves to be no problem at all, and allows me to smoothly distance myself from the other losers. This gives us the Mazda RX-7 LM edition from the first GT, and another 250k. The penultimate race before the World League is at Laguna Seca. It's gonna take a race-modified car to take this thing down and end its reign of terror, which is precisely why I won't be running it in the World League. The second-to-last prize of the run is the HKS Drag 180SX. Okay, I was mistaken about there being two drag cars from Toon Turbo Number 1. The other one's right here in all its 1,011 horsepower glory. But still not usable for us. One championship is all that stands between us and victory. But I needed to choose my track weapon and choose it wisely. I could go with the Speed 12, but I wanted to try something else. Something more... unique. A strange car had been calling to me ever since I started this run. It had almost 800 horsepower, came from France, and was one weird thing. It's the Renault Espace F1. It had to be mine. But I needed to make up my mind about what I needed to run in the World League, so I ran the Espace through its paces at Red Rock. What this thing was is a minivan that was converted to fit an F1 V10 engine making 799 horsepower and mounted in the former cargo area. It's not the first supervan of its kind, and those honors go to, well, the Ford supervan. But it was so quirky and so odd that I couldn't resist driving it. But the Speed 12 kept calling to me, reaching out to me, saying, Drive me. But no, I say, I will not be controlled by this demon. I will win the championship my own way. And this bizarre van will be my chariot. Onward! Oh, and I sold another Speed 12 to recuperate the costs of the Espace. Armed with our wacky supervan, it was time for the World Championship.
Kicking things off, it's Trial Mountain. The Audi TT LM blasts off into an early lead at pole position, its all-wheel drive definitely giving it a brief advantage. But I catch up to the TT at the final corner and do the classic Trial Mountain overtake from the top rope. Ever seen a minivan fly? After passing the TT, the Aspas never sees it, or any other car again, for the rest of the race, its V10 squealing as it approaches 170 miles per hour. Race number two, Laguna Seca. The Aspas spends the first two laps chasing after the TTLM, while also being cut off by the Vector M12 LM driving an illegal racing line. But by the third lap, I've caught it by using Forza strats and run away with the lead. If I had used the Speed 12, I probably wouldn't have won because of its excessive wheel spin and the lack of stability. Because the Aspas is tall and boxy, it's much more stable while encountering wheel spin. Race number three, frustration! I end up resigning from the entire championship because I frickin' hate that track and the Espas was being too stiff. Time for plan B. As much as I wanted the Espas to win it all, Apricot Hill was being Apricot Hill, and the AI were blocking me every chance I had until it all fell apart. It was time to succumb to the devilish calls of the Speed 12. But if the Kazama Mishima feud has taught me anything, it's that power isn't everything. While it dominated on the straights, it kept faltering in the corners. I needed another solution. I needed all-wheel drive, or I thought I did. I chose the Opel Calibra Touring Car. But then I saw the old Ford GT40 that had won me so many races. Was it able to accomplish the same result? The only thing that could stop that thing was itself. I knew I had to get back behind the wheel of my automotive soulmate. The identical GT40 fought well at Trial Mountain, but was beaten out by this same car. I was meant to drive this. It never wanted to lose control. It forgave all my driving mistakes. It was a car that won Le Mans, for God's sake. Back to Laguna Seca. The AI's driving style may seem unorthodox to me, but my driving style was equally unorthodox to them. I exploited their tendency to brake before they needed to in order to pull ahead. That and the fact that the corkscrew consistently gave them trouble. The other GT40 and Atlantic LM stayed in the hunt on lap two, but were overcome by how I drove. How would the GT40 test me on Apricot? Lap 2 would confound me on the AI's invalid driving tactics and send me to the back of the pack. But my composure and confidence rebounded because I knew I was behind the wheel of a car that I could actually control. Where the Espas and Speed 12 failed, the GT40 was extremely forgiving. I survived Apricot Hill in first place, ready to bid good riddance to that godforsaken track. Race 4 was at Rome Circuit, and I knew I would be able to win this. But the other GT40 thought otherwise, and I got too aggressive being hellbent on trying to overtake my equal. But on lap 4, I regained my cool and hunted down the imposter with my perfect driving line. Now it was my turn to dominate on the final lap. I knew I could win, because I believed. Now it all comes down to the final race, Midfield Raceway. I knew that the GT40 ahead of me was going to put up a similar fight to what it did in Rome. But I was ready to fight back. 
The two GT40s dueled for the first two laps, with my car getting the edge thanks to an unfortunate braking gaff on the AI's behalf. The other GT40 never got a chance to catch its breath after lap three. And I was home free. It was all over. I was officially the Gran Turismo World Champion. Finished behind the wheel of the car I was meant to drive to victory. I didn't need any 1,000 horsepower rally monsters. I didn't need all-wheel drive. I just needed the one car that understood me. It rarely lost control. It forgave me when I did screw up. It was fast. It was efficient with its power. And it had winning heritage to back it up. The Ford GT40 will be immortalized as the car that won Gran Turismo 2. And it proved that you did not need to rely on Japanese cars to win. The final reward was anyone's guess as it was a random prize from a pool of four cars. To close out this run, we were awarded the iconic blue Calsonic Skyline R34. What a way to end the game, with a racing icon joining a racing legend. If only for a moment. What a weird valley of difficulty. The start of the run was hard, with the hardest part being getting off the ground. But once that was overcome, the game gradually got easier. Granted, this has always been a part of the Gran Turismo 2 experience, as players have had 25 years to break the progression of this game. However, getting to the point where you can open the floodgates may be different to the next player. With this challenge, it was all about trying out different cars from around the world. There's a strong Japanese bias in the game's car roster, but the volume of cars from around the rest of the world would more than make up for it. Hell, I got to try out cars that I normally would never try. And that's why it makes the GT games so special. Finding a completely different way from the start of the game to the GT World League made this run so much fun once the hardest part was overcome. And I would absolutely recommend this challenge to anyone who's interested, if only to see how your garage differs at the end. Oh, it's over. I'm still trying to grasp this fact even after finishing the video. It's possible as long as you can believe in yourself and your car.